this is very much like old home week. I have friends and colleagues and, and mentors here who have been a part of my life and my career really from its inception. And so it, it, it gives me great pleasure to uh, be here today, to join you here today. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, follow on the heels of, of six of my illustrious predecessors who, with the benefit of hindsight and new jobs, have spent the day critiquing everything that we're doing now. <laughs> All I have to do is wrap things up and, and we'll be fine. Uh, Senator Brock negotiated the first free trade agreement ever signed by the United States. Ambassador Hills raised the bar by negotiating the largest free trade agreement to date, signed just over 15 years ago. And pretty much every one of the former USTRs here today played a role in the groundbreaking Uruguay round, the single largest multilateral trade agreement negotiated to date. With this solid foundation laid by my illustrious predecessors, uh, concluding and seeing enactment of a strong Doha round agreement and FTAs with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea should be a piece of cake, shouldn't it? <laughs> It could be, but we do have some serious work to do before we can cut the cake. As our Doha negotiations enter their seventh year, it's easy for some negotiators to begin to think of this as a lifestyle. It is not a lifestyle. No, trade negotiations are merely a means to an end, an end that will bring more economic prosperity to our shores. And if we are smart, and I believe we are, it will also bring prosperity to friends and allies around the globe, pulling untold numbers out of poverty. It's time to pick up the pace and to move rapidly toward that end. You've probably heard by now that we have new Doha texts in agriculture, in manufacturing, and in services that have emerged from the multilateral WTO process in Geneva. Uh, I'll be addressing them and our path forward in a minute. First, however, I want to take a moment to focus on the real significance of the moment at hand. Because make no mistake, we are in a race against time, and we have to make sure we know where we're headed, or we will get nowhere fast. A successfully concluded Doha round, along with enactment of the three pending FTAs, can help take us where we need to go. Anyone who doubts the positive impact of such multilateral and bilateral agreements need look no further than to the Uruguay Round and North America Free Trade Agreement. The collective impact of those two agreements is felt today by the average American family of four, as known by folks here, to the tune of an annual income boost of $1,300 to $2,000. In fact, Compared to the period prior to these two agreements, the decade plus that followed was characterized by stronger U.S. economic growth, higher manufacturing output, and lower unemployment. So the next two questions are, where are we today in this race, and exactly where are we racing to? The answer, again, is a successful conclusion to the Doha round this year. Doha is doable. We are working hard in Geneva to get agreement to the point where it's worth risking putting ministers back together again. <laughs> the issues in the room should be narrowed to where ministers have a finite number of high-level decisions to make on issues that will make or break the deal. These are issues related to the fundamental market access pillars of the round in agriculture, manufacturing, and services, along with the question of trade distorting farm programs. We have been driving to this point since the talks broke down in 2006, when we realized there was a disconnect between the level of certainty and meaning behind the headline numbers associated with farm support and those numbers associated with the market access components of the negotiation. Only now, courtesy of the multilateral process in Geneva, are we approaching the point where the structure and dozens of moving parts that give meaning to the headline numbers 
are sufficiently developed to enable genuine negotiations. Hence, the seemingly unending negotiations about negotiations. Just last Friday, as I mentioned, we received the latest draft negotiating texts for the Doha round from the chairs of the Agriculture and Non-Agricultural Market Access, or NAMA, negotiating groups. We received the text for services just yesterday. And in reviewing these texts, we are looking for how they move the negotiation forward. In general, they do. But our experience with these texts offers some important lessons going forward. First, slippage occurs when negotiations are reframed to placate the outliers, the naysayers, and the obstructionists. Efforts to achieve consensus in the WTO are critical, but not if they generate a lowest common denominator outcome that fails to generate economic growth. Second, it is critical that developing countries continue to be fully represented at the negotiating table. With that place at the table, however, a degree of responsibility and accountability that several advanced developing countries who have become major players in the global economy have not yet been willing to undertake. Finally, this is not a north-south fight. Forward-leaning developing countries that wish to make and benefit from market access contributions in an ambitious scale should be treated with the same respect as their less forthcoming, albeit louder, counterparts. In terms of specifics, the new agriculture text clearly captures the good work that has been done by WTO members to bring unresolved issues into clearer focus. And from that text, we see potential outcomes ranging from real new trade flows to merely skimming off of bound tariff rates. Yes, more work needs to be done before the text is ready for negotiations among ministers due to the sheer number of open issues we started with. But were the chair, with input from his Room E colleagues, to be empowered to narrow the scope of high-level decisions to a manageable few, he should be able to do so in the next two to three weeks. And what are these issues? Among them, the obvious and the not so obvious. What magnitude of cuts is appropriate to developed and developing country agricultural barriers and trade distorting subsidies? And how do we ensure that the use of sensitive and special product flexibilities do not negate the market opening purpose of the round. The current text is particularly alarming as it raises the possibility of excluding special products from tariff cuts and allowing protective duties under the special safeguard mechanism in a way that would result in more rather than fewer agricultural barriers at the end of the round. Yes, these are going to be tough calls, but they are manageable and with sufficient determination, reason, and creativity, again, they are also doable. <clears throat> the picture with respect to industrial goods is quite different. Not only does the new text offer a diminution of ambition, it raises new challenges when it comes to clarity for decision making. In fact, in its most recent iteration, while the ranges for tariff cuts remain, Developing country flexibilities that had been stable since 2004 have now suddenly disappeared. This new uncertainty creates the prospect that we must now duke it out over whether there should be more or less flexibility than in the original draft. This is certainly not a step designed to take us closer to ministers making choices. In its best light, the new text gives us the opportunity to bring about a more ambitious agreement. And yet it also opens the door for countries fixated on what they will not do. What are the implications then for the round going forward? We need to quickly develop a solution that juxtaposes the level of ambition and tariff cuts with the degrees of flexibility one is allowed to enjoy. The United States will step forward and work with any developed or developing country or group of countries as long as they are interested, innovative, and ready to contribute. And perhaps 
we should consider factoring into the equation what our professors used to call extra credit. The current draft contains an option for developing countries to renounce flexibilities entirely and instead opt for less severe tariff cuts. Why not also give credit for countries signing up for key sectoral agreements that go well beyond the tariff cutting formulas, such as in chemicals or electronics, healthcare, or forest products. Of course, the third market access pillar in the Doha negotiations is services. Those texts were released just yesterday. Farmers, ranchers, and manufacturers, especially small and medium-sized businesses, cannot take advantage of more open markets overseas if their competitiveness is hobbled by inefficient service suppliers at home in such areas as financial services, telecommunications, computer services, logistics, and express delivery. In contrast, any small business today can become a global business with reasonable access to the internet and express package delivery. So we must move beyond the first iteration of the services text to one where members make commitments to maintain current levels of market access and to create new market access. The United States also looks forward to a renewed bilateral and plurilateral consultative process on services market access among developed and major developing countries. This process should culminate in minister level engagement that coincides with conclusion of negotiations on agriculture and NAMA modalities. The United States will be looking for key members to signal positive improvements in revised offers, particularly in major infrastructure sectors. And for many countries, including the United States, no agreement will be reached on agriculture and NAMA modalities unless we have sufficient clarity on the realm of ambition in services negotiations. While agriculture, industrial trade, and services market opening are the core of the Doha negotiations, a much broader agenda is required by the Doha Ministerial Declaration. It includes trade facilitation, duty-free treatment for environmental goods and services, reduced subsidies that contribute to overfishing, more transparency in administration of trade remedy laws, and various issues of particular importance to least developing countries, including duty-free, quota-free. These issues will all have to be addressed in the final Doha package as part of the single undertaking, whereby nothing is concluded until everything is concluded. So what next? Ideally, the tasks, the tasks I have laid out in advance of a modalities breakthrough can be executed in the next four to six weeks. That would enable ministers to convene expeditiously to seek the elusive breakthrough. If, however, we are to have a chance of succeeding in the initial modalities exercise, we will all need to avoid the temptation of loading up the boat to the point where it sinks before it even has a chance to leave the shore. Without a laser-like focus on these principal market access pillars, none of us will enjoy the benefits of the other important aspects of the Doha portfolio. Since July 2006, we've had an impasse over one fundamental question. Will the Doha development agenda bring about meaningful new trade flows and thereby provide new and real global economic opportunities. This will only happen if all key members contribute on a basis commensurate with their economic circumstance and participation in the global trading system. However, we are keenly aware that we do not have unlimited time to conclude the Doha round. And this is a fact attributable to far more than the US presidential election. A year rarely goes by without one or more of the WTO's 152 members experiencing a key election or change of power. In 2009, for example, 
As the U.S. goes through its transition period, the European Commission and European Parliament turns over, Canada, Germany, India, and Indonesia may well face elections, and the current term of the WTO, uh, WTO Director General expires. The recent financial turmoil has reminded us, all of us, of the joint responsibility that WTO members have to achieve a successful Doha Agreement. We will not shirk our responsibilities. We in the United States will do all within our power to seize a strong Doha outcome if one was in, is within our grasp. This is doable. As noted by President Bush in his State of the Union address, the United States is committed to the conclusion of a strong Doha round in 2008, and we will provide the leadership necessary to achieve this objective. We look to our trading partners to make the same effort. During this critical period of the negotiations, we will also continue to work closely with our congressional and key domestic stakeholders to ensure the Doha Agreement works for America. And speaking of working with Congress, let me turn for a moment to the pending free trade agreements with Colombia, with Panama, and with South Korea that await action. And let me also note by way of transition that among our most pro-trade allies in the Doha round are our existing FTA partners. Why is that? When they could be out there whining about preference erosion. It is because they get it. They understand that trade liberalizing agreements contribute to growth in trade, which in turn contributes to economic growth and prosperity for the vast majority of our people. As 2007 was drawing to a close, we were able to catch a glimpse of what could and should be the rebirth of a bipartisan pro-trade coalition on Capitol Hill when both houses passed the Peru Trade Promotion Agreement by a strong bipartisan margin. Everyone had to give a little to get there. Witness last year's May 10 bipartisan accord. But this strong vote must be the basis for our work going forward to secure passage of the remaining FTAs and eventual reauthorization of Trade Promotion Authority. Taken together, the remaining free trade agreements offer compelling economic, commercial, and geopolitical reasons to support them. Whoever is in the White House in 2009 will be grateful that Congress succeeded in delivering them this year. The Doha Round, these trade agreements, along with the President's strongly stated commitment to improve and extend TAA, makes for a daunting but incredibly exciting year. As has been said before, if not now, when? If not us, who? It is hard for me to imagine a higher calling than what we as a nation can do through our trade policy to generate economic growth here and around the world, and to help lift millions out of poverty. A successful Doha round, the passage of our free trade agreements, and TAA will allow us to do just that. Now is the time to make our move. Thank you. has graciously agreed to take a few questions within her time limit here, so the floor is open for those. Mac Dessler, former colleague in many respects. I forgot to say she's really a quintuple threat because she also was a university administrator. Re recruited, I might add, by Mac Dessler to the university. The, uh, okay, I won't have to make that amendment to your introduction. <laughs> Susan, one of the things, there was an interesting colloquy and not in universal agreement among the former USTRs was the question of the relationship of some form of renewal of fast track authority to the Doha round. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a tricky issue, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about would you envisage getting to a certain stage and then trying to get Congress to enact a sort of a Doha only TPA or what, are, what is your sense? Is this uh, at what po at what point does this matter in terms of getting 
concessions uh, from negotiating partners, et cetera. You know the question. Yep. Um, thank you, Mac. Um, as you know, as a legal and as a technical matter, an administration really doesn't need trade promotion authority until you're actually ready to get enactment of the agreement. I mean, you can negotiate the agreement, you can sign the agreement. Um, without trade promotion authority, you need TPA if you want it protected in terms of, in terms of congressional passage. Um, in this case, um, it would be our intent once we've achieved a breakthrough in modalities, which is the first, you know, or say the next step here, but call it the necessary but not sufficient step to get a Doha round deal done. We would immediately after that go up to the Hill and start talking about trade promotion authority. Um, I have had conversations with congressional leadership about this. We know that the debate over TPA at that point would be largely a proxy for the Doha round. And it would be a proxy, you know, for the Doha round modalities agreement with agriculture, manufacturing, and services, and that transparency evident. Uh, whether we would also be pushing for trade promotion authority for bilateral free trade agreements is something that we haven't talked about within the administration. Uh, uh, but certainly, if you look at controversy associated with TPA, it has been more in the, in the bilateral FTA side, the bilateral regional side, than on the multilateral side. And um, if you, you, know, you listen to Speaker Pelosi talk about uh, international trade and the Democrats' history of being pro-trade, she specifically talks about John F. Kennedy and the Kennedy round. So there is a long bipartisan tradition when we're talking about multilateral trade rounds. So the answer is, assuming we get modalities and we think we are um, poised to get a modalities deal done, uh, we would go up to the Hill and seek TPA, recognizing that we really don't need it until the deal is complete. Um, the completion of the deal uh, could be done, I mean, you know, I didn't talk about the steps that follow modalities, but you're talking about exchanges of schedules, you're talking about finalizing the negotiation of schedules, and these other very important elements of the Doha round that I talked about, we figure they can all be completed um, within six months, I mean easily within six months. Uh, so, uh, well, nothing is easy in this business. <laughs> within six months, um, five, six, seven months, whatever. But, but that, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Dr. Lee, who's the director of our sister think tank, the Korea Institute for International Policy and Seoul. Thank you, Fred. Uh, just yesterday, Korea's National Assembly decided to put Korea-US FTA ratification bill on their agenda. And uh, probably they will hold public hearings uh, this week or next week. And I'm expecting that I will be called upon there to be a witness. And uh, the questions asked by the uh, assemblyman might be like this. Even when Korea ratifies, and even when Korea solves beef issue, then uh, what if U.S. Congress does not ratify or U.S. Congress postpone the ratification uh, until next year? You know, and uh, if it is delayed until next year, and if the Democratic candidate takes office in the White House, then what is the chance for U.S. requesting Korea for renegotiation. So I'd like to hear your answer to that. Thank you. <laughs> let, 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 let me suggest that, that, that I, there are just too many what ifs in your question uh, for me to, for me to uh, uh, answer. And, and, I, and I would like to, to recognize Ambassador Kim, who is seated at the front table here, who was the lead negotiator for the Korean government of the FTA and a formidable Formidable, truly formidable, um, counter negotiating counterpart indeed, uh, who is now representing Korea at the United Nations. Um, we all know uh, that even though the beef issue is not directly associated with the FTA, it is what is holding up action on the FTA. Uh, and it's understandable when our agricultural community is able to say, 
it doesn't matter what happens to tariffs in Korea if we can't sell the product. The FTA doesn't mean anything. We are optimistic that the beef issue will be resolved, and, and there have been numerous commitments, public commitments, private commitments, um, on the part of the Korean government that this will happen. I believe that as soon as the beef issue is resolved, there will be a major transformation in the debate over the Corus FTA. And why is this? This is the single largest free trade agreement that we have negotiated, and it probably is the single largest free trade agreement that's ever been negotiated, bilateral free trade agreement. Someone would have to go back and do that, someone would have to go back and do that research. But my guess is, um, certainly in our case, since the Canada FTA, and arguably now we're talking, you know, it's a trillion dollar, Korea is a trillion, South Korea is a trillion dollar economy. Uh, what, tenth largest economy in the world, our seventh largest trading partner. And the potential benefits, the very real, tangible benefits to the U.S. economy and to the Korean economy are so huge. All you need to do is look at the International Trade Commission report on the Corus FTA, which estimates that, you know, we're talking about over $10 billion boost to U.S. GDP, uh, U.S. exports increased over $10, $11 billion, increases in Korean exports, clear competitiveness implications, positive competitiveness implications on both sides. And so I believe that the debate about the Corus FTA in Congress has not been joined. It simply has not been joined yet because the beef issue is an excuse for other issues and for the debate not to move forward. And I believe once the beef issue is resolved, um, it will be a much more, th there'll be a dramatic shift. There'll be a lot of interest on the part of agriculture, manufacturing, services in the United States to have Congress press ahead. And at that point, we'll have the real debate. We haven't seen it yet, and we'll see. Uh, but I'm optimistic. I mean, the Corus FTA will be enacted into law. Jeff Shaw. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Susan, for your, for your comments. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, you said several times that you don't need trade promotion authority until the deal is done. Uh, does that really mean that you think you can get a good enough deal from our trading partners without having that authority in your pocket? And the second question is, uh, there are a number of things that we would have liked to see in a, an eventual package that won't come about because of the time constraints and the way the negotiations have evolved. Uh, has there been any thought given, uh, particularly with a view to uh, concerns in the next Congress uh, about ratification of a deal, uh, to including a built-in agenda of work to move forward on new negotiations sooner rather than later, and perhaps <laughs> even add the issues of climate change, ta oh, subsidies and Jeff. taxes. Jeff uh, already, because your job isn't hard enough as it is. Jeff is already negotiating the next round, and I haven't finished this one yet. <laughs> um, uh, Two-part question, obviously. TPA, um, if you're asking me would I prefer to have TPA in my pocket right now, sure, of course I would. Um, is it going to make a difference in terms of what is in the deal? I do not believe it will make an appreciable difference. Um, if you think about it, if, if you think about, there are times when I sit with my colleagues from other countries and they tell me, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do the other because it's too politically sensitive. And my response is, well, you ought to have TPA. You need it as much as I do, maybe more. <laughs> Right? I mean, the alternative is I just can't do it. And we are going to negotiate exactly the same agreement with exactly the same attention to sensitivities, ambitions and sensitivities that we would if we had TPA, quite frankly. I, I don't see it any different. And if our trading partners, you know, there will be some trading partners who decide this is a really nice excuse it's going to start getting hot in that green room in Geneva. And the U.S. election or the absence of TPA is a dandy excuse for any country that doesn't want to deal. But quite honestly, that is just an excuse. Because if they want to deal, 
You're talking about the government of the United States signing an agreement, all right? And at that stage of the game, yes, we'll come back to Congress. We have gone through, I can't begin to describe how many consultations, rounds of consultations with the Hill, with the commodity groups, with manufacturers, with service providers, with our private sector advisory committee members. Over how many years? Looking at Rob Portman, he, he was part of this equation. My, uh, my great mentor, predecessor, and friend who's, who's seated here. It, it, I think it'll be the same deal. And in a way, you know, the vote pursuant to TPA is one that is a proxy for the agreement, and it would in this case. I mean, really, the vote, a vote on TPA would be a proxy for, for the Doha round. And we'll see what level of commitment there is to a multilateral trade round that is designed to generate growth and economic development and alleviate poverty in poor countries. On the second question, on climate change, there is in fact a very important provision of the Doha agenda that unfortunately will not be in the, in the um, uh, initial modalities exercise but is in that very important uh, uh, single undertaking related to climate and the environment and that is the proposal to eliminate tariffs and non-tariff barriers on environmental goods and services. And I think that plus the um, end or dramatic uh, reduction in fisheries subsidies that, that, that result in overfishing are two of the most potentially significant and, and generally overlooked provisions of this Doha round negotiation. And I would hope that will be uh, our first major contribution to show that trade can be a really positive contributor to the environment uh, and climate change. Susan, if there was one point of agreement uh, this morning among the former STRs, it was that additional steps are needed to deal with the domestic costs and downsides of trade liberalization and globalization, therefore with the politics of the issue to which you just referred. In your remarks, you reiterated President Bush's commitment to the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. As you undoubtedly know, Senator Baucus took this podium two weeks ago and indicated that until there was action on his TAA reform bill, there wasn't going to be any congressional action on anything else on trade. In that light, does the administration support the Baucus reform? The inclusion of services workers under TAA and the several other initiatives that he feels are a minimum requirement for your commitment and the President's commitment to be implemented. It would be wonderful, it would be curious to poll my predecessors at some point about the proportion of the time that they spent negotiating with trading partners as opposed to the amount of time they spent negotiating with colleagues at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue in the Congress. Um, uh, and just as I would not um, negotiate specifics of the Doha round at this venue, I'm not going to talk about specifics on trade adjustment assistance, other than to say that the President has been on record for to over two years supporting the extension and improvement of TAA. Uh, we have a formal statement of administration policy that came out in response to the bill that passed the House of Representatives last fall. Unfortunately, uh, that bill went from zero to House passage without any opportunity for hearings or for serious consultations with the executive branch. Uh, but we have um, made it clear to Chairman Baucus and uh, Senator Grassley uh, and others uh, in the Senate who are interested in this, as well as Ways and Means Committee and, and uh, House leadership, that we're prepared to work with them on a bipartisan, uh, you know, successful bipartisan uh, TAA package. Uh, I would, I would um, uh, note that on questions of, of sequencing, 
We have three free trade agreements pending. We have trade adjustment assistance. We'll see what happens with the Doha round and TPA. We have Andean preferences. There are a series of things that are coming together on the calendar within approximate time frame. So uh, I'm confident that where there is a will, there is a way. I actually thought you were going to say you spent as much time negotiating with other agencies in the executive branch. Uh, because on this issue of TAA, where budget costs and things like that come up, uh, I do want to press you a little bit. You're willing to work with the committees, sure, but it seems to me, purely personal view, that unless the administration is ready to accept some significant broadening and extension of TAA, that all the things you just mentioned may wind up dead in the water. I've said what I have to say. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I'm going to have to release you because of your time commitment. Uh, Susan, thank you very much for coming. We wish you the best of luck in the whole agenda.